right. Well, let me tell you, we're, we're in a doozy of a case here. Uh, that was a great presentation by Danielle. Thank you so much. And I think so. Let me just, I'm going to go quickly to this while we're trying to struggle to externalize this wire. We'll, uh, we'll show you. I'm going to point it, like John said, against the wall and see whether it pops in. But while Karthik does that, I'm going to have our fellow quickly present the case. So I just want to introduce my team quickly. We've got Dr. Guja next to me. We've got Dr. Uh, Raman Sharma next to me. Uh, we've got our team with Kevin and Ryan and uh, Damien, uh, as well as Habib here. So we're very grateful for their help. And without, uh, because I know we're short on time, we're just going to go right in. So, we'll, so, so can, we, can you go ahead and present the case? Let me yes. See. It's too big. Awesome. Yeah, good morning. Uh, this is a um, CLI multi-level obstruction. You can go next slide, please. Torque it against the wall, please. Yeah. So 79, hypertension, Olympic. smoker, CKD3B, uh, he came in with bilateral foot pain, um, so occurring at RAS, small ulcer ulceration um, on the dorsal side of the left second toe. Uh, he's Rutherford category five. His medications are as above. This is a good Creatinine is 1.7, um, as a Doppler PT on the left, and the ABIs are 0 0.61 on the right, 0 0.5 on the left. His duplex is basically monophasic waveform all the way throughout with depressed velocities. You can go really next slide, please. That's a yeah, show the it's first it's uh, it's angiogram. It's pull, 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 pull a little bit if you want. So this is his um, uh, erotography. You can see that the iliacs uh, severely diseased on the right, uh, some disease on the left as well. His runoff CTO in the SFA at the mid reconstitution uh, in the distal. And then uh, his runoff is about two vessel runoff over there with a CTO in the AT. You push the catheter forward, Roman. You coming? I doubt. If you want to take okay. The, if you want to take finish the presentation. So, so as you can see, uh, I want to go sh show you the angiogram of what we did. So while we externalize, is the wire out? Yeah, I think the wire's oh, out. Yeah, well, that's out. over here. Wire is out. Yep, is so out. you can pull the catheter out and the snare, hold the wire. So let's go scene minus here. So, so Srini, so we've got multi-level. We've got a significant iliac disease. We've got an occluded SFA, and we've also got uh, what is it called, uh, tibial disease. I'm going to show you all the above here. So scene right. minus, yeah. put put a clamp on that. Um, and so what we did was, let me do this. Yeah. So you can see here, we went up and over here, very, very calcified iliac. I know he showed you his creatinine's a little high, we're not taking that many pictures. So we went up and over, and then what we did was we took one picture of the, of the SFA. This is below the knee, I'll go to the SFA first. So the SFA, below knee has two vessel runoff, but nothing in the foot, in the, in the area of the ulcer. And this is the level of calcium that he has. So he has significant, guys, off floor, please, when I'm presenting. So Yes, he has significant calcium, um, and, oh man, okay, so he has significant calcium, and so therefore we said, okay, like, since everybody tried multiple different accesses, let's try just to go with the standard access like Kenny had described. So we went ahead with an 035 system, and uh, can you, how do you see the fluorophades, guys, the, uh, the other stuff, we, and we could not break the cap no matter what we tried. And you see there's this large collateral here, and then you could see there's another collateral there that actually allows us to get back into the SFA. And then, like I said, he has a, a posterior tubal dominant in the foot and, and, no, and perineal dies off and no AT at all. Next, next picture. So I need to see the floor. Can I see the floor saves? I'll play it for you. Okay, we're going to have to see the floor safe. So let me just describe what we did. So, so we went ahead. I, there we go. So we went ahead and tried to enter with a straight glide. Did not go through, no matter how much we pushed. Next. So then we changed that to an 018 system. This is the, and then we went with an 018 uh, Connect 250T. And this is the 014 system not going through. Then we went with an 018 system with a Connect 250T. And we tried to push the catheter through. It didn't work. Then uh, Connect 250T popped through, next. Then we went ahead and changed to an 018 uh, 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 support catheter, which Sarumo Navicross did not go through. Switched out to a 014 cat uh, wire and a 014, uh, what is it called, uh, teleport from CSI, did not, and finally got up to that point. You couldn't do much. Next. So then we're like, okay, we, we struggled for a little <laughs> bit. Next. And then what we did was we said, let's loop the wire and let's get an outback. So we looped the wire next door, and then we came, we came with the Outback. Outback was about, could not get through. So we kept bouncing off. So then what we decided to do is do a direct SFA stick. So we stuck the distal SFA, because I didn't want to stick the, uh, the uh, what is it called, um, the only vessel to the foot. 
So we just, as you can see how calcified it is, how much it's moving. You can see I don't have arthritis in my hands. And then we went ahead and just uh, stuck the SFA. Next. <laughs> and then now we went ahead with a uh, OV, V18 wire all the way up and, of course, didn't get through. Next. In the meantime, with all our, 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 our uh, you know, fiddling around, we dissected the proximal. You'll see. Next. So as we're working, we dissect the proximal. And, and the proximal is dissected, so that collateral, you can see, there it is. So you can see now we've dissected the, the collateral, we've dissected the proximal SFA. So now we're, we're pulling this back. And, and so as finally the Terumo uh, gold tip wire goes through with the little helicopter technique. Next. And then we finally have now externalized the wire. So you can see now we've got a, a, a clot sitting proximally as well to deal with. So we're making it exciting as you guys are talking. So I want to just tell you our plan. We've externalized the wire. Now we're going to go ahead and put a filter, filter down distally. And then we're going to do some aspiration of this thrombus versus maybe give some lytics, but we're very subminimal. And then, and then after that, well, our plan is, was to fix the AT and then go after the iliac. But I guess that's going to be a little too ambitious for today. We'll do that off the line. But, but you'll, work, you'll see us working on this thrombus, and you're going to see us working with Shockwave, uh, as Danielle presented, uh, regarding uh, the level of calcium that we have. I welcome any comments as, as we start switching. So, PK, you've got a great panel here. You've got, Listen. obviously, Dr. Bajakian. You've got Jay Matthews, uh, your very own Sardar. Latest. Farhan, Sahil, Parikh, who we know, and also, uh, I think we have a tool, Kukar. Yeah, that, right? Right. Okay. Yep. So what, maybe we can go down the line of the panel here and see what, what, what is your thought at this point in terms of how you would manage yeah, this one. I see forward. what's happening, PK. I, I, mm -hmm. I want to lose the wire. Right. You're not going to lose the wire. No, I'm uh, saying uh, You know, I think we've all, we've all been in similar situations, unfortunately. Got it. Um, and yeah, yeah. I think... Wow. It's un it looks well, unlikely have, to me that you're going to need a lot of lytic therapy. I think you can probably remove that with, uh, um, with an aspiration device. And I would pre-dilate prior to using the shockwave you since you couldn't really um, advance any support catheters. I don't know what people feel about pre-dilating. Um, and then I'd, I would use shockwave throughout this entire thing. I think you'll have good success with it. I wonder what we'll use after shockwave, though. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, right. uh, I, I agree. I, I'd, I'd take uh, uh, aspiration catheter down first. You know, this uh, in the whole so-called you know, laser cat oh, technique. I'm sure top. Kumar talked about that as well. Um, you know, so after uh, you know, personally, I would use indigo after that. Um, act, in, in contrast, I would probably laser and then probably shock. So this might be a laser shock case. Do so you, you would aspirate, aspirate first, penumbra or something like yep. that, then laser, then, then shockwave shock wave is the way you're, 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 like, your like, algorithm. Yeah, in, in this case, because it's, you know, I think the, the shockwave may be even more effective in that combination, potentially. It's an expensive, expensive case, but it works. <laughs> expensive, okay. yes. Sahil? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would have maybe thought of was pulling the laser to break the cap earlier. Uh, I've, uh, I've have been in similar situations where you can't even get sub eye because there's so much calcium in the wall, and sometimes you just have to burn a hole into the cap. Uh, now that we're through, I don't know that I would invest in the laser. I'd probably asp aspirate, and then uh, and I would probably IVIS. I just find that uh, the shockwave is more effective if you size it properly. But once you're deeply subintimal, I think it's the safest thing to do. And then uh, shockwave, and then DCB, and then you're going to wind up probably with a few superas in here. Ajit, what do you think? Yep, um, <clears throat> I agree with uh, kind of what everyone's been saying. I think keeping the through and through wire is important because it's going to be really hard to track anything through this, especially a, a penumbra. Um, but I would definitely do a thrombectomy to get rid of that clot. And then uh, I would use a shockwave here and DCB and then spot stent. Yeah, so Ajit, you know, we, well, uh, uh, can I just, uh, the one thing is, uh, I agree with you guys, but we got a through and through wire, so we've got the, the probably the greatest level of support. So what I decided to do was push a, uh, a Navi cross over this through and through wire. Show me down. And then put a filter down and then have to go with it with a filter. Okay. Oh, oh I don't want to come out of the body here. Okay. So now, now I, need a, I need another wire. Give me another uh, uh, command, wire. command wire. Let's give me a little dime, make sure I'm not yeah. out of the vessel. No, you're not. So, so now I, I, I should be in an area intraluminal here. So, so I'm just going to go yeah. ahead and push my command wire down and lose my access okay. outside. And then I'm, I'm going to go ahead and push my catheter further down. But my only question uh, in choice of thrombectomy devices, 
which device would you guys use? I know there's Pounce, there's uh, obviously Penumbra, there's uh, all these, uh, now the new Jedi. Jedi. And I'm just curious what the panel would advise me. Jetstream. I think if you have Laser. all the options at your beck and call, you're lucky. I think a lot of places have one option. So for me, my option would be Penumbra because that's what I have in my lab. Anybody use an export catheter here or anything like that? That's no, not going to work. No way. It's not, not enough aspiration. But how big is your access, PK? Six or seven? Uh, yeah. Seven. Uh, live cases, we always do seven size. <laughs> yeah. Lightning seven. Lightning seven is probably where I'd go, yeah. I, gr I agree with you. Okay. All right. I mean, uh, the Jedi, we, we, we haven't quite gotten into our contract yet. So it's a little upsetting, obviously. Love to have, a, have, a, have a had it live, oh, but we don't, we don't have it. Okay, okay, there's my wire safe. So now I'm going to have Raman pull out this external wire from the inside. Go ahead, pull it out. Hold on. Before you do I got it. Just... I got it. I got it. All right. Now you don't want to lose this. I'm going to push this forward as they pull that out. Okay, pull it out now. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Just pull. You're fine. Okay, so now I'm just going to advance this now. Now, now go ahead. Give me a... Uh, a, uh, uh, what is it called? For the, uh, for the surgeons on the panel, would, uh, would, would all of you have done endovascular first here, given the scenario? Would anybody do something else? I'm hard pressed to go to surgery first in most any patient. I, didn't, I don't remember the age of this patient. If it's a really, really young patient, maybe I would consider maybe. surgery first, but I'm endovascular first, regardless of the surgical um, options, options available. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. I would do an endovascular first approach. The other thing to consider is just if the patient has vein, though. Yeah. Knowing that ahead of time is important. Map them ahead of time, yeah. Would anybody give TPA in this case? I don't think it's... Bolus a TPA into that vessel? There's a bare wire. There's no flow. I, don't think, I think I would try first. You haven't tried a more basic you operation would and safer. Right. Well, especially now with a direct stick, I'd be a little bit... There's a bare wire, right? Dead. And if I recall, so right I think it's a patient in, right? with rest Sorry. pain and an ulceration, a small ulcer on the second toe, I think is what it was. And that run he, he, no, he has an ulcer, right? He has an ulcer in the forefoot, um, and it's involving the base of the first and the second toe. And it's quite, and so it's not a large burden of volume of wound. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, that's why we decided with a short segment SFA and the iliac, we were going to do both since we wanted to demonstrate multivessel and then discuss the AT at the end. Yeah. But no. So why, why, what I'm going to do now, Srini, is I'm going to put the filter down. I'm going to tee up the penumbra, go with the penumbra on the side while, while you guys give some lectures, and then yeah. you can always come back to us. I'm going to give you a quick update. So what we did was, I'm going to show you in a second. I'm just going to go get this balloon down there. We did exactly what uh, was suggested by Jay and, and Daniela. And what we did was we did a uh, penumbra, which actually – very pleasantly sucked out what we needed to get out of there. What size? Then what we, size uh, penumbra did you use? Uh, we did a seven lightning, as was suggested by Sahil. Yes. And uh, we went ahead and just did this. And so now we then after that, we did a quick uh, uh, shock wave. Can you show that, guys, before you go up? Um, we did a quick shock wave. So, again, well expanded. But, but, you know, uh, areas and the reason we shocked away approximately was because uh, the IVUS showed that there was issues and I'll show you the IVUS. So the shockwave, uh, again, very, very nice expansion. And I want to show you the IVUS. Can we go live on the IVUS before we go ahead and, um, and uh, break off so they can give another talk? And uh, how many pulses did you do at each level there, uh, PK? I think we did uh, two, the full. two yeah. twice, right, Robin? Yeah. yeah, we did the full. So here's your IVUS. I don't know if Eric's on the panel as well. You can take a look. And you can see here we have some dissections distally like we talked about. And yeah, you can go up. And, and that was the area where uh, we were concerned. Uh, and then you can see we're pretty much interluminal since we cross retrograde. And then a lot of calcium. And again, not very good expansion. Uh, so we decided now to go up with a, with a uh, Dorado uh, balloon to really expand. You can see the dissections there at the level where we had the thrombus. And you can see it's a very, very complex dissection. And then, again, you can see true lumen, false lumen. And then as you come up, you have heavy plaque burden all the way up to the top. The problem with IVUS is, uh, as you know, Srini, it, it makes you want to stent everything. Uh, but so obviously we're not going to have to do that. So what we're planning on doing here is using a scaffold with Zilver PTX uh, and, and, and obviously stenting up to where we've identified as the proximal area. Uh, so that, that was kind of our idea. Any other thoughts uh, on this? 
So as all of you know, we have about 80 fellows that are attending uh, this conference uh, this year, which is great. And one of the questions was spot stenting an S a fempop segment versus full metal jacket. And uh, we know that, you know, Hong, uh, I think, published a paper in Jack 2014 or 15, which he showed that spot stenting was, was better. But then Tomai in 2019 did the same study and showed that it wasn't better. So... I think there's there's really no RCTs on this. There's some small studies, but I think the the, the answer we don't have it yet. But what are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think the IBIS guides your therapy here, uh, and so those areas of dissection, you know, I would tend to do uh, um, you know focal therapies for those, and then of course the area recoil. I think that you're going to have to put the you know the Zilver, Alluvia, or whatever you want to use, or even a Supera. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I, I, I think some of the reason for the differences in um, patency rates for long segment stenting is due to the fact that we've got improvements in the, in the technology of our stents. Yeah. And that makes a huge difference in how long of a segment we can treat with uh, improved patency and decreased stent fractures. Would everybody use drug uh, eluding technology here? Yes. Interwoven nitinol stents? Do you have to use drug here? Mm -hmm. I, I think there's no disadvantage to using drug. I mean, if your goal is primary patency, then yeah. in every lesion subset, drug will give you more primary patency. Uh, whether or not you need to scaffold, I think sometimes you can be fooled if you try to judge too early. Oh, so we do have a pretty calcified segment that you're treating, uh, PK. Uh, would you put a Supera here? It has good three-year data. has no drug, obviously, but good crush resistance. Well, you know, uh, you, you, I... I <laughs> I don't know. There's no head-to-head -head data. I, I think we've expanded this really, really well. I don't know whether, you know, the the silver, I like the fact of putting the drug with the silver and having the scaffold at the same time. Yeah. So to me, I, I was just thinking, you know, save a step, put a silver in and be done with it. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I would poll I the mean, audience you, or, or the team. How many of us feel like you could DCB this and, and leave it? Right. That's the other question. Why not just DCB this at this point? I mean, that's that's what I would do. I mean, I would All DCB right, so, this whole so thing. So I, I think I, I, that's a good segue to Sardar's talk uh, because we just uh, yeah. did some work on that. Right. So so that was a good plug for, uh, for from Sai for me. But I think I think that you know the, uh, the at least our studies have shown that you know the recoil is an issue. So I think and also with impact long, uh, you know, knowing that there were forty percent. Uh, the provisional stent rates, I think we're going to have to stent this you know, somewhere. So while, while you guys go to the talk, I'm going to re ivis it, and then we'll analyze it together. Right. Yep, I just want to show you the IVIS, um, and then uh, obviously you guys can see we decided to stent it based on the IVIS. Uh, can you show the IVIS very quickly? Um, you know, great talk, Sai. I think you're right. It, it really does help us to have head-to-head uh, -head data, and I think we need to have more of that data available to us to make decisions. Uh, we could talk a little bit about why I chose Silver PTX rather than Alluvia and all that. I'm curious to see your thoughts. But we, we went ahead and, and repeated an IVIS after ballooning. And you could see here that the, the distal vessel is expanded nicely, but the section at, at the site uh, around a centimeter mark. And then we went ahead, did IVIS in the middle. And you could see there's areas of severe recoil. Uh, I'd say greater than 30% in one area and some areas about 20%. And then, and then you could see as you get more proximal, there seemed to be a little bit more dissection, as you can see there. That's right in the middle. And then, you, it, so it didn't improve much with our, our balloon inflation, which we did keep it up for quite some time. And there's residual plaque and maybe some, some um, gummus material behind it. So, so based on this IVIS, and you can see the complexity of the dissections, I, and then the difficulty that we had getting through this, I, I really didn't feel like uh, that I should leave it with a DCB. So I went ahead, I vessel prepped it, um, not only with the Shockwave, but with the 7.0 Dorado. And then we went ahead and put a, uh, a stent in, and I'm just gonna do the, the next IVIS online, and then you guys can go to your lecture so you can see how it looks. So we're, we're coming down uh, with the IVIS catheter. We still have our filter in place, as you can see. And I just want to make sure this Dorado is not pinched, you know, it looks like it looks bad. So you can see that the, there's your distal Dorado. I mean, your, your distal silver PTX, Zilver, yeah. forgive me. And you could, yeah, you could see here as I pull back, not as beautiful as a Supera, I, 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 I do admit, but not badly, um, you know, expanded. 
no real areas of real major collapse, at least that I can see. And uh, maybe a little bit here, we might hit it again with a balloon. Um, and so this way, you know, I'm pretty happy with the lumen I've got. I've been able to tack up all the floral from you got. I've been able to tack up all the dissections, especially proximally in the mid. And uh, you can see here, as I come to the proximal edge of the stent, everything is good. Off floral, guys. I mean, off uh, Ivis. So, so, so I think that overall, we've got a, we've got a good uh, result with this. And um, I'm probably just going to take a, a picture or two and then, uh, and then just stop for the sake of time. But you, why don't you go to the next talk and I'll show you our final completion. Yeah, no, that's great. Great results so far. Yeah, we're just going to do very quickly. We're going to show you the final pictures uh, and then we're going we're to go after the AT. So this is the, um, the lesion, uh, but the final result. I mean, would, I'd like to again ask the panel whether my choice of silver was something they would have done or they would have gone with another stent. Um, but we decided to go with the silver, well expanded, and we post dilated that one spot we spoke about. And then we did our final runoffs. And you can see here, it, by the way, I want to do want to comment that the collateral did stay open. I was very grateful for that. And in the final runoff, you'll see that the, the, the uh, forefoot still doesn't light up. But now you can see the AT when you could not see it earlier. Go minus. So we've only given 50 of dye. So the question is, do we go after this now? I just want to see if I wired very easily. If I wired very easily, I'm just going to do a silver hawk atherectomy. No, it's before this. Uh, I'm just going to do a silver hawk atherectomy of the, uh, of the uh, anterior tibial artery and then do a prolonged balloon inflation and, and leave it till we get uh, bioabsorbal stents and some more exciting stuff. But right now you could see here that, you know, this is the pre-shot of the forefoot and you could see the perineal comes and prolonged the cine. We were waiting, waiting, waiting. You have a wonderful posterior tibial, uh, but you do not have that forefoot really well uh, perfused as compared to now. So yeah. I'm just going down with a command wire and seeing how it does, Flora. So basically, we got two questions here. I mean, I, to answer your second question, you've got a lateral plantar that's open, but you've got an incomplete pedal loop, right? AT is out. Perineal yeah. is really not giving any good communicating branches. So I think you'll heal. The rest pain will resolve, but the ulcer will have to see. Maybe the inflow is good enough fixing that iliac and that fempop segment. That may be enough to heal. You could stage this at this point realistically if you wanted to. I, I, I don't think it's a very difficult lesion. I'm just going to give it a whirl. If it goes, it yeah. goes. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, I figured yeah. we're here. We might as well do it. Yeah. Plus, I got all you guys here to help me. So I just figure, let me see if it goes. And then I think yeah, on the other like question, going, like maybe we can get the panel involved here. You know, you had a really tough proximal so EXL, guys. that was heavily calcified, tough to get through. We all agree that a scaffold was needed. Sure. Um, how do you guys, or how do you all decide between what type of stent you use? Zilver? versus D versus alluvia versus say a supera, which again has pretty good three-year data, even though it has no drug. Smart on, right. If it's optimally deployed. Some, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think sometimes it, a lot of it's dictated by the size. Um, and, and here, this is a big vessel. I mean, on the Ivis, it was seven and a half roughly. So unless you have big superas, that's, it's going to be a, a, a suboptimal option. Uh, and then you have to choose between alluvia and, and here he put two long silvers in, which seems perfectly reasonable. I think, again, using drug verb or not is a good strategy. Uh, and certainly, I, I think that given the size matrix here, silver was probably the best choice. Um, so I think that, uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, we did use a, a 7 -0 silver. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that in, in that perspective, you sometimes are limited by the size matrix you have on your shelf. And yeah, the anybody else? It's massive. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, uh, we don't have Zilver. We, we've, we Does it matter Luvia. which one we use here between Zilver and uh, we know the data? Yeah, I mean, there is an you, incremental, if, uh, you know. A little benefit of alluvia over Zilver. Practically over, speaking, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I think the point is drug and scaffold, right? So Yeah, the, the only difference is you might have had to use three alluvias to get this length exactly. versus right. two Zilvers. Right. So, I mean, right. I think there are some practical costs. Some practical I, cost think I think they do now have the 150s. I think they just were launched. So, yeah, they, they do have more longer ones, yeah. So, so Srini, the, the one thing I do want to say is, you know, I know with Imperial yeah. we quote it, but unfortunately these lesions have not been studied, you know, by right. uh, at least as far as my knowledge with, uh, with the, uh, the, um, the Boston stand. So the question is for me, you know, we got the Japanese PMA data that's been published with dialysis patients, calcified patients, 
I mean, Zilver's fracture rate is uh, after three years remains a static 1.88%. And I think with good vessel prep, like Danielle's talk, I think we were able to achieve good expansion. So I, I'm not hanging my head on that data, but I th think there is a lot of real world data associated with Zilver that's not talked about enough. And I, and, and I think that's what we're doing. Uh, so that's why I don't think it's a right or wrong, but we just decided to do it. Now in this, I know it's, it's time's up, but I'm just going to tell you what we're going to do. So at least you know. So we, we cross quite simply. We're just going to do a quick directional atherectomy down with the, with the Silver Hawk yeah. EXL. Or, that's what I have, right, guys? We, we have about five minutes, PK. We're done with the talks now. So Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so we'll be able okay, to kind good. of stay tuned at this point. Well, talk yeah, to you. so I'm just going to cut this the, the segment that was very, very tight, and I'm just going to off. And for those who don't do Hawk, we're just going to do just the length of the nose cone on. Is what, what, and we usually just do a one-plane cut off, see? So there it's not crossing. So I think we're going to do a little dotter here, see whether we can get this through. Doesn't seem to want to go. There it goes. Little, don't, you know, you shouldn't try that at home usually, but we did it here. So, so let's go on again. So we're just going to go right through this again very, very slowly. I think this is the area that was quite bad. And we're just going to do off. And we're going to just balloon it now on. Would any of you guys IVIS this? Yeah, I was just going to say, PK, I mean, off, talk about off, a data-free zone. Uh, pretty much everything we do below the knee is a data-free zone. I think that... Uh, the one thing we have learned is that, uh, as you said, this is a big Ivis. anterior tibial. Uh, it might even be three and a half. We just don't, we don't know it. And, and the big problem we always have is habitually undersizing our treatments yeah. for, for below the knee. So I think, uh, you know, Ivis would probably be helpful. Uh, although uh, I was on a live case with uh, uh, Andre Schmidt recently and they don't use Ivis. They just ask the patient how much it hurts. Right. Um, and if, if, <laughs> if, if they've dilated enough that it hurts, that means they're stretching the adventition that's big enough. And part, part of the problems with <laughs> Ivis and tibials, too, that are chronically narrowed or occluded is you don't really get a good sense sometimes of, you know, the true size. Evis helps. Sometimes you can use that to get a better idea as, you know, for the fellows. Obviously, most people tend to under dilate tibial vessels because of, you know, we, we don't have a lot of bailout yeah. options until the TAC showed up. And, um, you know, we know from, okay, you know, right. there's a, a study out of Switzerland, which they did angiographic correlation and I, you know, where they did a angiogram, treated a tibial, waited 15 minutes, repeated the angiogram and they lost two thirds of the lumen. So we know that there is significant recoil in tibial vessels because of, you know, really dense, you know, calcification, whether it's intimal, uh, medial, as well as, uh, crests of, of cartilage and bone that we're seeing in, in, in some of the, uh, microscopy, uh, sections. And, and, and uh, that's a great point, uh, Srini. But Sai, I'm wondering if you could comment. I know in the Life BTK, I don't know if we're allowed to comment on the controversy with how to size with IVIS among specialties. Right? Yeah, so I, mean, I think uh, it's so just important. What, yeah, it's important. On that. Yeah, so for, you know, in the, for 30 years of coronary experience, we size from media to media and then round down to the next size. So, so this vessel, just looking at it, it looks like a, probably about a 3-0 vessel, media to media. Um, the, the, the instinct is to size lumen to lumen, but it, I think it really is dependent upon the type of technology you're going to use. So here below the knee, it's balloon expandable three technologies. Three oh, three oh, three so in those balloon expandable three technologies, three oh, three. you go media to media. If it's a self-expanding device like, three say, five, for example, oh. Supera and the SFA, then it's really the luminal diameter that matters. Um, but I think in all other cases, you want media to media. And I think that's two really five, important. Two. No, 2530? Just and then also you can talk about balloon escalation here, right? Oh, Do you need to go straight to the true size of this vessel, or can you start gradual in a chronically narrowed and diseased tibial vessel? Start with 2.5, gradually go up to 2.5, low pressure if you've done atherectomy, obviously, and then go to 3. Do you need to do that, or can you just go straight to 3? What are yeah. you... I think low and slow is more likely to give you fewer dissections. Yeah, and I think I, that's I mean, what we want. Yeah. So you don't, I don't think you need to do escalation. Uh, uh, it, it, the, it, the, the, the duration of treatment, I think, helps with the recoil. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of other technologies coming as well, too. You know, but, you know, obviously, uh, we have Serenator sure. currently, and then yeah. also Spurs coming up as well. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll try to address some of these recoils that we do see, unfortunately, with these vessels. I mean, that's the concept of vessel you know, prep here, right? The idea of vessel prep here is to try to return the compliance of the vessel so it's a little bit better than, than what you started with. And then basically go with low pressure angioplasty, sometimes four atmospheres at most is what you need. 
to get really a robust and, and good you know result with good luminal gain. Tear gas. So. But the key here is we got to see so, what this so what, loop looks like, I, right, and what what the vessels look like in the foot once he's done. But if you size it by ibis, you're I not going to get barrel trauma. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. that's the key. Is, you know, that's the key. We know that from the coronary literature uh -huh. as well. I mean that uh, you know proper sizing here, I think makes uh, well, makes all the key. Do we need to let's well, let's ask this question? Do we need to do any vessel prep here? Can we go straight to no, the, I be in the foot? I think you, you need to. Some prep is needed. I I, yeah. I would have gone with CSI. That's just yeah. my my uh, animal choice down so, below the knee. Yeah. But I, I, mean, think, the, I think something is needed. The, yeah. we, uh, we all believe it, but we can't prove it. Right. Uh, exactly. I, and I think that's the challenge, I think. Although some will make the argument that, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. it helps us in the acute setting to get a better result. Again, you know, we have no outcomes data to show, to show that it's really So how, how many of you Probably would just balloon more. it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it, here where they're not that resistant lesion, yeah. uh, you might have argued just to balloon the whole segment. And for the fellows, you know, you've got orbital, right? Four big categories, right? Orbital, directional, laser, and rotational, you know, plus minus some others. In this case, you know, PK did directional. Could have easily have done, like Dr. Kukar said, CSI, which is orbital atherectomy, shave cool. that calcium and plaque, get some pulsatile forces to microfracture that medial calcium, so they say, right? Shockwave it, and you could shockwave it. Yeah, yep. that's the other one. Lift it. Yep. IVL. Yes. So, so what we did, what we did was we we went ahead, used your, followed your good advice, did a two five. I wanted to ask Jay his experience and also a, a Danielle her yeah. experience with how she balloons with the CLI patients she deals with up up, up north. The uh, the idea here is, uh, you know, we always struggle with do we start with a larger size balloon or a balloon, and then you know, regardless, sometimes you you end up dissecting because of the mixed morphology plaque on these lesions so jay if you could if you could let me know about the tack and 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 uh, and also uh, let me know about the the balloon sizing danielle would be great uh yeah so just with regards to, to tacking i mean obviously that's going to be ibis guided so um if i see dissections uh by ibis uh and then uh th then the btk tack uh place uh selectively will be i think very useful I, i'm i i tend to be sparing i mean i'm not putting a ton of tacks all the way up and down unless you have a long dissected segment but again i do tend to try to size uh, media to media with a long balloon uh get a good result then i ibis and then i uh will tack selectively if i have to mm -hmm. btk oh. danielle do you want danielle, to you that's a great point so, you know, I, I think we've all said here, I think IVIS is key. I, I think the, although we don't have the data for this, I think the reasons that we fail with below the knee so, is undersizing and also leaving sure, sure, focal sure, dissections the, the, that we can't see on um, on angiography. No, the other way. My personal paradigm is to size the vessel and mm -hmm. not upsize my balloon. I start with, if I think it's a three vessel, yeah. I will start with a three vessel, a, a three balloon. Um, the longer, the better. And IVIS afterwards, I most of the time um, will utilize some type of atherectomy device. I've been using Shockwave in the severely calcified lesions of late. Um, and then for these focal dissections, I think leaving them alone is the biggest source of failure. And so I think TAC is ideal or off-label stenting. Yeah. So what, what we did was we took a, a, a Jay's advice and we used a serenader up top so this is a, I mean, for those who don't know, maybe Srini, you can describe it. Uh, we've been using quite a bit. We've got great, a uh, lot of experience with it. And I think probably uh, some of the most in the country. And, um, and I can tell you that we've had, uh, you know, stent-like results and not had to stent which is what I was really, really happy. And also resistant lesions also expand at lower pressures. So you can see the proximal uh, lesion there at the uh, AT is having trouble expanding despite atherectomy. So I'm just going to use a little serenader, give a little nitro, and take a picture. So if you still have this uh, narrowing up top there, uh, PK, are you going to think about a uh, coronary drug-eluting stent? That was my question for the panel, TAC versus coronary drug-eluting, yep. and, uh, and then see what, what you what guys think. We I mean, I'm We've got some drug, good data that was just but, published, right, by George Adams, you know, on, uh, on the mean, TAC. So, I mean, obviously the... Uh, uh, and by the way, it's FDA approved, right? Correct. It's on yeah, label. It's approved. Which are off label. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, for uh, full disclosure. And the, uh, the, the, the data would tack uh, going out. The patency rates uh, beyond 12 months are actually pretty impressive. Again, you're limited to the proximal third of the calf if you're going to end up doing coronary DES. So, really give me one. Uh, you know, for osteo lesions, proximal lesions, I think coronary DES works very well. And I think we do have data that supports that. Of course, it's off label, but... 
uh, when you get to the middle uh, distal part of the calf, then you're really looking at tack. Yeah. I, I would. I, so I, I, um, we just. I'm, some, I'm sorry, PK. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I just said we just keep some night pride. We're going to take a picture. I apologize. Okay. Danielle, did you want to? Um, I'm pretty aggressive about utilizing off-label uh, yep. uh, DES for the proximal portion with good results. Um, I think that's far preferable than leaving the vessel alone and hoping it's going yeah. to um, resolve. Yeah. And I like the fact that it's drug-coded technology. It's what yeah. I, it's my paradigm yeah. for the SFA, and it's my yeah. paradigm for the tibials as well. Yeah, and for the fellows, we've got good data for proximal uh, tibials treating with coronary DES. Obviously, what we're starting to see now are stent fractures still, even in the proximals, especially that AT coming from Posterior to anterior, right through that that membrane. So let's go back in with this. I think they do work well. We got decent data, but uh... so so there's a lot of recoil down below. So I'm going to go back in with the serenader. This balloon actually wraps pretty good, Srini, which is surprising. Yeah. Jay, you use a lot of serenader, well, I go. think, right, as well? Uh, well, actually, um, we use a bunch of different maybe Sahil, Sahil is uh, uh, you. Legit. No, no, we we are uh, trying to get it on our yeah, shelves too. We're, we're in the current phase of going through contracting. <laughs> we're uh, we're uh, we're dealing with the gauntlet of yeah. the uh, the VAC committee, but exactly. we, we, I think that these are the kinds of cases in which this technology is perfectly applicable. Yeah. Um, you know, we, what we would hope is that we'll have below the knee DCB to follow. Uh, that's another major gap in our bag, and we haven't been able to prove yeah. the value proposition uh, effectively. Um, yeah. So there's a number of ongoing trials that will hopefully uh, come to light here in the next couple of years. And we know about the Saval trial, right? Rob Lickstein is going to be talking about the Saval trial and the, and the results, well, which weren't optimal, obviously, right, for below-the-knee self-expanding yeah, drug still, coded stenting. There's still some hope on other scaffolds yeah. uh, yeah. below the knee. We'll, we'll yeah. talk about that some tomorrow. But So let's talk about maybe... Needs. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, a lot on met needs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about uh, medical management. What's our uh, our cocktail? No. Compass, Voyager, no. etc. Uh, DAPT, no DAPT. Yeah, Obviously, we're extrapolating DAPT from coronary data, and we don't really have peripheral data. No. Well, not great. I mean, there is some data for Zilver actually that DAPT makes a difference. Yes. Uh, and so I think, given that we use Zilver up top, um, you're probably going to use DAPT for a period of time. Every package insert has some required minimum yeah. duration of DAPT. Um, I think that the Voyager data are compelling, and for a CLI patient like this, um, as long as there's no other sort of uh, clear contraindication, I think using low-dose Riva uh, either initially or after the first month uh, combined with uh, aspirin, it, or as we do with AFib patients, use Plavix in the DOAC, uh, I think that would be a reasonable choice. I think that's going to be your best. Dapt for how long? Measure. One month? Dapt for a month and then switch over to uh, uh, Riva plus uh, Plavix probably. Another comedy, yeah. Yeah, so that's, uh, I think we, we do a lot of the Riva Plavix combo. Um, it, it's still unclear that aspirin actually adds a lot of benefit to, for a lot of these drug eluding platforms. It seems like, uh, you know, we're extrapolating again from elsewhere, but uh, um, the combination of Plavix and Riva may be sufficient for, for, for the drug eluding stents as well. And we should add that that's not what was studied. That was Voyager. not what was studied, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. The Voyager was aspirin <laughs> plus Riva. Correct. How about uh, Ajit or Danielle? You know, I've, you been do, I've been doing the same, especially for complex <laughs> tibial disease, mm. because there's such a high failure rate. I, yeah. I've been going straight to that, despite the fact that that's not in the... But the bleeding right. risk is a little bit higher. It, it, aspirin drive seems to drive a lot of bleeding, okay. so it, and we've yeah. seen that in multiple yeah. other studies. So it's unfortunate that uh, Compass and Voyager didn't look at that particular combination because Plus I think that's really interesting. Well, it's expensive too, right? It's not uh, easy for some patients to, to get. Uh, Jeff, what, what about you? What do you do yeah. in your practice? For me, uh, I would say for a low, lower risk intervention, like if I was just treating the SFA, I'd probably do aspirin plavix for one to three months, depending on what I put in. Mm -hmm. And then for a tibial intervention, if it's again like a, a kind of the treating the proximal tibial, and you know I'm pretty happy with my result, I'll maybe just consider aspirin and plavix. And if it's like a more distal lesion or a higher risk lesion, uh, I'd consider anticoagulation with either low dose or full dose uh, Xeralto and uh, plavix. So you're stratifying based on where the level of disease is for you. For you for level the of disease and also just what the outflow is, the what, outflow you know, is. what I think the patency yeah. is going to be. 
You know, How about you, you too? What, uh, what's your, what's your uh, I usually go more aggressive. So I think if you have a, a low bleeding risk score, I would go with Ashton Plavix and the low dose in the beginning. I'd give time for the wound to heal. I think once the wound is healing, at that point, I'd back off the aspirin. Uh, and I think if you have a low bleeding risk, and of course, you know, every patient's a little different. If they're 85 years old, I, I would go with a dual antiplatelet. But if I had the room, I would go with all three in the beginning. And we do this for the coronary uh, also. So we have a coronary stent. We'll do aspirin, plavix, and sometimes full dose uh, anticoagulation for a week or two and, and watch and see what happens and then stop and back off. So I think if there's bleeding risk is low, you're, you're, you're safe to do it. So I'll be honest with you, you know, we, we talk to our vascular medicine docs all the time about this, and I get so many different versions from four different vascular medicine docs in our, in our own uh, university setting. It's, it's very nuanced. You know, well, how many stents? Was it spot stenting, full stenting? Was it above the knee, below the knee, et cetera? You know, so yeah, I mean, what's the outcome? Part of the like? problem also, too, is that the elution kinetics, yeah. too, is different depending on what you end up putting in yeah, uh, between the coronary stents mostly versus the, uh, the SFA stents. So yeah. I don't know how that plays into it as well, too, but the idea that if you still have drug that's eluding Stuck on you know, and you put, potentially take them off the antiplatelet, uh, that could be, or, or in Plavix specifically, that could be problematic, but we really don't know. Well, I mean, I, th I think, yeah, we could get deep in the weeds on that, too. Yeah. I mean, whether the drug is the thrombogenic part or it's the oh, scaffold right. itself, right. Right. right? I mean, right. I think in, in coronary intervention, Water. we've realized that it's more likely oh. under expansion is the number one sure. predictor of stent failure. And, and certain oh, polymers, certain, for example, uh, the fluoropolymer that's also on alluvia, which is on the Zion's family of stents, Very low. Is, is thromboresistant. Yeah. And other polymers are perhaps less thrombos. Yeah. Which is why we can get away with one month. And the coronaries have higher flow rates, correct, than the For tibials. Sure. So For sure. you know, yeah. if, they're, if you're getting that problem in the coronaries with stent under expansion, oh, the sure. tibial is going to be even worse. Only right? worse, like, yeah. Like Danielle was talking about, optimal so, luminal gain, right, is what we need. So Srini, the great discussion and learning a lot. I just wanted to tell you what we've done. So we went ahead and used the serenade in the foot, scene minus. So, so we thought it was because of uh, poor outflow. So again, there was no dissection. We feel very comfortable doing this. And at Ivis Wise, it was a 3-0. So we then took a picture. <clears throat> and you can see the flow is not the best. It's keeping up with the posterior tibial till then. And then watch. <clears throat> Um, I've taken a, a, a transit catheter deep and I'm just going to go ahead and just, you know, give a little bit of dye to get the vessel going and take a picture. Um, give me some dye, guys. You think you could angulate that, ang that, uh, that tibia and fibula a little bit more? Is that possible, PK? So we'll get a We're better look. Yeah, actually we can. Yeah, absolutely. Just to get like a true lateral foot. We're trying to, let's see. If this uh, it looks like there's some, something some in the dorsalis machines. that's the problem, maybe. Yeah, there's, there's I know. Out, outflow I, I see that side. Uh, can somebody, let me. Just, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't mean to tell There you go. Like right there. That's it. Okay. Good. Let's take a picture. Do you see? There you, oh, go. there you go. There you go. There you go. Some nitro paste to the uh, foot the might be a out? good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but the wa <laughs> the washout is poor, though. You guys see yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. You're, you're, so I don't know why. Uh, is it, I don't see the stuff. So well, but you yeah, you could argue that this yeah. is all uh, microvascular obstruction, and you've got yeah, basically yes. small artery disease, right? I mean, that's the problem, and um, you know, I'm not sure you can do much more at this point without being really aggressive. So what we're going to do, mean. what we're going to do offline, guys, is we're going to fix the inflow, fix the iliac as well. Yeah. And uh, we're going to do shockwave um, and, a, and a covered stent because it's very, very uh, calcified. Likely a live stream, and then we'll be done. Great. Great. A great so case, tough job, case, guys. complex case. Thank you. Thanks, PK. Thank you, Srini.